forward on this. Okay. So I'm going to go open that model up in any logic. File open. We're going to go there and okay. Uh, did you do? Um, oh, yes. Uh, I neglected myself to go download that. So I will go through those exercises here and we'll get it down on my computer and we'll now open it in any logic. Um, yeah. So um, this is an HMIC model and uh, it has a bit of hybrid logic associated with it that we will kind of not emphasize here. Um, I'm going to instead emphasize some some broad features of it as an agent-based model, and uh, and then highlight some emergent behavior from it that illustrates principles like locking and path dependence, illustrates tipping points, et cetera. Can we do this? Okay. So um, let's go see what's on the left-hand side. Broadly, we see components of the model up top person, a home, a clinic, et cetera, um, various types of agents, uh, a main environment, which is this broader environment in which people will be circulating spatially to different spatial locations. Um, kind of like there said earlier with like homes and workplaces or what have you. And then we're going to have uh, uh, some set of scenarios here down here, which run the model with different particular assumptions. Do you remember that first day of class and, or where we first ran a model, we could ask what if um, people recovered more quickly? Remember that? It, it's kind of a similar idea, but here we're gonna be changing, there we go, incubation period. Um, uh, and we're gonna be changing assumptions about the number of clinics. Okay, let's go in. So. Agent-based models have one or more population of agents. And these declare the agent, sort of the theory of agenthood for each type of agent. For a person, it's a particularly um, simple theory of personhood, but involves some considerations about whether, what their status is with respect to infection. It's called the natural history of infection for the person. Um, the rules by which the infection, the logic by which the infection progresses or that they clear the infection. And then uh, another state chart, which has to do with factors governing whether they seek care. And the reason the two are, are both characterized here is that within this model, once people are infected, um, the only way they can recover is if they are treated for that infection, okay? Um, it's not too far off from certain diseases. Like um, I mentioned earlier, a gonorrhea, for example, and that can persist for very long periods. It, it does have some natural clearance, but but it, often it persists for long periods and, and uh, people um, uh, really uh, recover vastly faster if they're, if they're treated. So the only way in which someone here is treated as, is, is regarded as recovering is if they are cured, okay? By some antibiotics. So, um, uh, and, uh, and in order to get those antibiotics, they need to present for care. They need to go get care in a, in a clinic. So let's go go to clinic. So this is our theory of personhood. And technically at a at a um at a computer science level it's represented as a class, right? You should know what that is. Um and you notice people have characteristics, sex, incomes, homes. These are aspects of what? It begins with H. It's a long word. What well, does I, I use it to mean like variety. Heterogeneity. Heterogeneity. Yeah. We 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 contrast that with homogeneity. What is homogeneity? Yeah, everything is the same. Everything's uniform. Um, uh, no distinctions. Here we have distinctions by sex, by income, and by home. This is very common in agent-based models. We we can very readily add in 
uh, a distinction. Um, if we want to to capture someone's uh, sex here, for example, is treated uh, autonomously, but if we wanted to to capture their migration status, born in Canada, yes or no, in an aggregate model, we would double the model size. We'd need like each stock and for that matter, each flow characterized for those who were born in Canada and another one behind it, like that layer, for those who were born outside Canada, we'd have these stratification, this, this layering, right? Um, whereas here, all you do is you add a parameter. You know, it's, it's additive. You're just making an additional distinction in your specification, okay? Okay, yeah. Of course. Okay. What does home represent here? Home represents their home. So this is a characteristic I mentioned in the in that video and in the slides that when we have, and, and I really like Francisco's question for this, when we have an age-based model, we can have, give people characteristics, as we said in the quiz, that are that are not just discrete, you know, you're either born in Canada or not, or uh, but we can also have ones that are continuous, right? Like, what was my birth weight, or what's my current height, or something like that. And we're supposed to treat it like, for the model time frame of three decades. The same over time. Um, but we can also have some characteristics for a person that are relational, meaning they refer to another agent. This refers to a home, it refers to their home. We can give people a home. We could give, we could say who's the mother of the person. We could say who's their service dog. We can have them refer to another agent. And that's what that is. So your question is just wonderful. Thank you. Um, it, does that address your question? Okay. So, and, and you may wonder, well, what are these other agents? Well, there's a home and home is particularly simple. They're given a location. Um, where they're at home. And then clinics have a bit more logic, which we're not going to go into right now. Does anyone recognize? Do, do you want to, I told you this is a hybrid model. Do you want to have a gander? What what sort of type of model logic is that? Okay. Discrete. Discrete one. Mm. So the clinic keeps track of people coming to it and there are a limited number of healthcare workers and they wait. If, if there's a lot of people waiting, the person who comes is going to wait for a while until they can get served, and they may leave early and leave with, against medical art, leave without being seen along that top. Or, but if they wait, they can get treated, and the treatment may be successful or not. With a certain, with a certain probability, it's uh, successful. Probability of treatment success, otherwise, it's 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 not. Okay. But I promised, so, so these are some characteristics of an agent-based model. You know, we have multiple populations. We have, we have uh, each type of agent having kind of a theory of, you know, personhood or clinichood for the model. And then we have many particular people in the population, a population of people, um, a population of homes, a population of clinic. OK, and each person in this population, for example, is given a random home to live in. They're, they're placed in a random home. And generally, there'll be fewer homes than people. They're given a random sex and they're given a random income. OK. Um, we OK with that? And, and see, recognize some features of all one or more populations of Asians individually distinguished. These agents have characteristics, your things like income tax, et cetera. And their those characteristics can be relational, like homes. Um, but these individuals are also placed in an environment. And in fact, if we go to Maine here and we scroll down here, um, we could go look in the space and network, and we can see that these people are scattered in an environment of 500 by 500 units. Each of these little squares is 10 units um, placed in a random location. And they're connected up in a network that's uh, distance-based uh, initially. Okay, so they, they're connected with nearby people, people within um, 7.5 of these little squares of distance around them. 
So they're in an environment and they're going to be interacting with others in their environment. And in nature-based modeling, a lot of the interest is what's the emergent behavior that comes from agents interacting with the environment. Okay, now I promised that I would show you some principles of system design. So may I do that? Hearing no objection. Um, doesn't look like people will riot at that prospect. I'm going to now, I'm going to, we're going to try running the model. Are we okay? So first let's run the baseline. That's kind of our default. When I talk about a baseline in this class, I talk about a, a scenario that's kind of our reference scenario. You know, when we measure things, we need a reference point, right? We need some notion of what's one unit of length to measure all the length, right? Um, and here we have a baseline scenario that commonly serves as a point of reference. We, we see the behavior for that, and then we study the behavior for other scenarios. So let's run it for a baseline scenario. And, and in fact, if we go to the baseline, we'll see, okay, there's a population size of 1,200 people, 400 homes, one clinic, one healthcare worker per clinic, and per treatment conferred 95% probability of of uh, successful treatment. And there's some other characteristics that I'll, I'll dwell on less. So I'm gonna run this and I'm going to show what, what we see um, as a result. So what we see is some uh, a broad set of people and homes, but we also see uh, that these people are distinguished by their color. Uh, those who are green are susceptible. Those who are yellow are exposed. Um, and so they are in this state, as I recall. The color is yellow. We assign them to a, to a certain um, yellow color. You'll notice here, I'm also keeping track of the number of times for each person that they've been infected over time. Hmm? Could you imagine, how would I, in, in a system dynamics aggregate model, stock and flow model, do you think I could easily keep track of what's the distribution, the number of times someone's been infected? No, because it gives us a picture right now with the status, but capturing that history information is really difficult. We'd have to somehow, to capture it, we'd have to put it in a different bin, a different stock or something, and, and that would be really quite awkward. Okay, so these people have now turned red. They've become infectious. And, and by virtue of that, they might, they might uh, infect others, but they also know that they're infectious, uh, or excuse me, they, they, I think here we assume that, um, that when someone's infective and symptomatic, they may start to transition to needing care. And so the, they'll go in for, for care here. And you'll notice that up here, we, we give some totals from this on the number of people infected over time. And you'll notice that something just happened. What just happened? Did anyone notice? Yes. Uh, name? David? Katie. He almost just exponentially exploded. Yeah. At first, it was kind of kicking around at a low level. Could have actually, by chance, it could have gotten out back then. But then at some point, it exploded. Let's talk about some why this is. Well, if we go, we look, this is a histogram across the population, the number of times they've been infected. Up here is something about the fraction of time that, that the healthcare workers are actually busy at any one time. And if we go look at the clinic, we'll find that this clinic is totally maxed out. Most people are leaving without being seen rather than uh, continuing on successfully to be treated. So, so right now, if we pause it, if you look at these statistics, 13,000 people have, have gone on to receive treatment, but 340,000 people have left without being seen after it exceeded the amount of time they were willing to wait. So this clinic is out of control. It's it's um, it's maxed out. We don't have enough healthcare workers conferring treatment. 
to be able to control this infection. And the infection, remember the population size was 1,200. So what is this telling us, this graph, about the fraction of people that are infected? Almost everyone's infected, right? Okay, now, our fate is not dictated by the stars, but by ourselves. And, and let's let's see what, what, what it takes to control this, may we? Okay. So uh, right now we have a single clinic, it turns out. Um, it's, it's right here and it's totally maxed out. It's, it's healthcare workers are working flat out like more than 97% of the time. I'm gonna add a clinic, may I? That's what this button is here, add a clinic. So now I have two clinics. So did that dramatically change the situation? Well, it lowered it, right? It sure lowered it from about 1,100 people infected to about 975-ish or so people infected. But did it, was it enough to wipe out the infection? No, no. Okay, let's add another clinic. I just added another clinic. Was that enough to wipe out the infection? Mm -hmm. You notice the the fraction of time that the healthcare workers are busy is coming down, but it's still over 90%. Let's add a fourth clinic. Has this wiped it out? No. We're now down around 800. Did it help? Yeah, it helped some. But was it enough to keep it under control? No way. Let's add a fifth clinic. Has this brought it totally under control? Francisco. Um, I have a question, I mean, what would happen if we added the clinic before? We well, okay, good. So we're gonna be getting to the, exactly that point. Okay, we have five clinics now. Is this enough to wipe it out? We've got it down to, you know, just above half the people infected at any one time. You can kind of see it's a mixture of like uh, green and, 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 and yellow and red. Let's try six clinics. Has this wiped it out? Mm hmm? No. Okay, seven. What happened? We wiped it out, right? Let's go. Let's go check out the clinic. What, what's going on at the clinic? Oops, sorry. I'm, I'm looking at individual population members. I didn't need to do that. I meant to go check out the clinic. Um, we have seven clinics. Healthcare workers are are. It's kind of got a lagged measure of their business, but almost no one's coming in anymore because the infections died out. Okay, now let's ask Francisco's question. Let's suppose instead of adding those healthcare workers uh, uh, later in the game, let's suppose that we added them uh, early on. So I'm going to add here a... Uh, two clinics from the start, okay? Otherwise, it's it turns out it's the same parameters. You can go compare it. Two from the start. Okay, so Lou, did I press this? Thought I pressed it, but maybe I did. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna run it. I'm watching the time. What happened? What happened? Illness count zero. What does that mean? Yes, uh, Mr. Deshati. Yeah, it prevents buildup of what? Of infectious people spreading the infection while they wait, right? Right? Milton once said, 
they also serve who only stand and wait. And here they not only serve, they like infect people, right? <laughs> um, so died out again with, with two clinics. Let's try it again. Obviously, it's going to vary a little bit, but let's just see that these are not flukes for what Daniel was saying. Let's let's make sure these are not flukes. We do this by running a set of them. And there's ways to do this automatically. Here, well, it's it's gotten in fact, it's gotten a bit established, so it hasn't always wiped it out. Um oh, what happened? What happened? Yeah, so sometimes it wipes it out and sometimes it spreads. Tipping points, ladies and gentlemen. It can reach a tipping point. Give me give me an understanding. What is it that causes it to explode? Yes, Ken. It eventually reaches a point where the clinics are at full capacity, so they can't treat lingering infected, which causes it to improve. Yeah, and so the infected stay infecting longer, so they infect more people, and then even more people need to go to the clinic, and it just takes off. Okay. Two isn't quite enough to reliably do it. But it's close, it turns out. Three is the ticket if you do it, as Francisco said, from the start. If you do it from the start, two, and, and it to really be reliable, it seems three, will be enough to keep the infection from, from, uh, from going gangbusters, from spreading from becoming endemic as we said how does that compare with how many clinics it took to bring it under control after it it spread to high levels how many did it take anyone remember six or seven yeah yeah it's like seven and so so folks this is an illustration of a lock in effect when it gets established it's much harder to bring it under control than it takes to head it off. To head it off, how many clinics did we need? Two, two or three, um, um, three or fifteen, maybe a rare case. We'd have to do some formal experiments to study that. Two or three are enough to, to keep it quite reliably under under control. But to bring it back under control once the situation is established, you need much more effort. That's an illustration of locking, in fact. Mm -hmm. And there's a tipping point here you saw where it go at low levels and then it takes off, right? It it hits this tipping point, which as Ken said, involved clinics becoming maxed out and thereby people having to wait longer and thereby spreading it more and therefore the clinics being even more maxed out and it just takes off. Um, that's a tipping point. We also see illustrations of path dependence. It matters what happened earlier, what's going on at time 100. It, it could be that it's died out entirely in some cases, or it could be that it's taken off at very high levels. What you do earlier, whether there are clinics in place from the get-go or only later matters a great deal. So that is an illustration of a tipping point. Once you're in this tipping point, there's a lock-in effect. To, to deal with that after the fact, to pick up the pieces after the fact requires much more effort, much more resources than to head it off. And you can probably think of many examples where this is the case. And unfortunately, these are facts often missed by policymakers who don't have experience with complex systems. And they say, well, you know, why should we invest in fire prevention? We haven't seen a fire in a long time. Or... You know, we can't pour money into programs for, you know, kids who are poor. They're too expensive. Well, what's the cost of not doing some things? The, these models help us look at it. And one of the things that shows us is sometimes a stitch in time saves on. A, 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 just an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Investing early, but judiciously, carefully, can pay off hugely compared to how much it would take by not investing, how much you have to pick up the pieces later. Okay? So some principles of system science coming out of a simple agent-based model. I'll leave it there for you to explore more, but we're going to be building models like that in the agent-based world. Okay.
Yes. Yeah, like why are they all like well I'll tell you why. It's it's a it's a little bit of a silly thing, but um you'll notice that for kind of in radial patterns and different orientations around the location of the clinic. And they are going to the clinic and coming back. And then the process of like, they're verbal. And when you send them to the clinic, they turn and like approach the clinic in that direction of needed to go there. And then they turn and they stay in my direction. And so there's nothing terribly deep about it. Just when they say go to this place, it, it, it orients them by default so that they approach it in the in a direction that in physics we call normal to it. So they're they have a bit of a pathway here and they're at an orientation that's, that's normal to this at right angles to that pathway. And then they return it. <laughs> It's kind of silly thing. If you have a bunch of clinics, other clinics that will, um, uh, you know, people kind of oriented around them. Uh, but if you prefer, you can think of them as really sick because they're lying down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're asking for the Oh, yeah. Please show me how to make an amphibian. Please, please educate me. Yes. Okay. They never 